this is the third and final part on bu building biblical friendships. You can turn to Proverbs 27 to get us started for tonight. Proverbs 27. Just keep your hand up till they find you. Uh, hopefully there's enough. If not, maybe married couples can share or somehow find a friendly solution. All right. Thank you, guys. A few choice nuggets and juicy quotes that I enjoyed. I thought I'd pass on to you to get us started tonight on building biblical friendships. It's been said there are many types of ships. There are wooden ships and plastic ships and metal ships, but the best and most important types of ships are friendships. The only unsinkable ship is friendship. Someone else said, the golf course is a wonderful respite on which friendship can flourish despite the handicap of playing the game. I think that could apply to other sports as well, perhaps. Another has said, friendship is unnecessary, like philosophy, like art. In other words, it's not a biological necessity. It has no survival value, he says. Rather, friendship is one of those things that gives value to survival. Or another, he said, is any pleasure on earth as great as a circle of Christian friends by a good fire? I tend to think that was a single guy. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, a day for toil, an hour for sport, but for a friend, life is too short. One of my favorite books on marriage is Joel Beakey. It's called Friends and Lovers. Beaky writes, next to new life in Christ, close friendship in marriage is life's greatest gift. He says, I am privileged to be engaged in a number of ministries, but friendship with my wife is worth more to me than any of these ministries. Her friendship is priceless to me. There is something deep and mysterious about this bond of Christian friendship in marriage, he says, because it reflects the very nature of God. We might define it as the personal bond of a shared life. As a happily married man, I can definitely say amen to that. Praise God that we have here in the book of Proverbs ancient, divine, heavenly wisdom, the best book in the world and most proven manual in all of history on friendship. Out of all the 66 books of Scripture, the Holy Spirit chose through the pen of King Solomon and some associates to use Proverbs to educate us on relationships, to train us in how to form godly friendships that last and how to build biblical friendships. Amazing that we can hold in our hands the very word of the living God, the only infallible authority and perfect guide for our friendships. Let me read some of the texts on, from Proverbs chapter 27 on friendship that we either have looked at or we will touch on tonight. Proverbs 27 verse 5. Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Verse 9. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, so a man's counsel is sweet to his friend. Do not forsake your own friend or your father's friend. Do not go to your brother's house in the day of calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother far away. Verse 17. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Our Father, as we come to our final message on this very vital subject, how true it is, show me your friends and I'll show you who you are. If bad company corrupts good character, O oh Lord, and if a companion of fools suffers harm, as your word tells us, those who walk with the wise truly do grow wiser in good company, improves our character and can, will make or break our spiritual life and our church life together. And if we are a people who sing loudly in our uh, hymns and uh, joyfully declare what a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus, what a friend of sinners and so forth. May that show in our friendships with one another. Oh God, if you had not befriended us, never would we know true love, real love, lasting friendship supremely 
explained and modeled and understood through the Lord Jesus Christ. Please teach us tonight. Be our mentor. Be our teacher. Make, uh, drive away the folly and the foolishness and selfishness that so taints and spoils and breaks and weakens and poisons our friendships and infuse more and more wisdom into our every relationship and into our friendships for Jesus' sake, the greatest of all friends. In his, the name of our Lord, we pray. Amen. Four proverbial keys to building biblical friendships. Remember, principles from wisdom for evaluating the friends you have, finding the friends you need, and most of all, being the friend you ought to be. The friends the friend that your friends need you to be, the friend that your church needs you to be. First of all, biblical friendships are constant. We looked at various texts there. Someone else said, a true friend is one who walks in when others walk out. You know a friend like that? I sure am blessed with more than a few. Another has said, it takes a long time to grow an old friend. Biblical friendships are constant. Number two, We looked at last time, biblical friendships are candid. They are candid, and we looked at various texts there. Usually, if you're frank and self-aware, let's be honest, the last to see our own flaws is ourselves, right? Otherwise, we would have fixed them. (laughs) Everyone else sees them very clearly, and that's why we need honest, caring friends willing to take risks in their love for us. Let me tell you about another famous friendship of church history, a lesser known one, a fairly well-kept secret. You probably aren't expecting me to refer to the great Genevan reformer, John Calvin, the the so-called harsh, cold, unloving theologian. So say the critics. But there's a French historian, Stauffer, who reckons there were few men at the time of the Reformation who developed as many friendships as Calvin. End quote. Two of Calvin's closest friends were his fellow reformers in Geneva, William Farrell, he's one of them on the Reformation wall, one of the other three statues next to Calvin, and then the other is Pierre Verret. Calvin celebrated his friendship with these two men in his preface to his commentary on Titus. Calvin writes, I do not believe that there have ever been such friends who have lived together in such a deep friendship in their everyday style of life in this world as we, the three of us, have in our ministry. Ferret, Calvin, Farrell. There never has been any appearance of envy. It seems to me that you, too, and I were as one person. And we have shown through visible witness and good authority before men that we have among us no other understanding or friendship than that which has been dedicated to the name of Christ and has been to the present time of profit to his church and has no other purpose but that all may be one in him with us. You want some proof? Extant remaining letters from Calvin to Pharrell, 163. You wonder what they're going to say in our day. They're going to look back and be like, well, he had this many chats and (laughs) this many texts. I don't know. Um, Pharrell to Calvin, 137 letters. Calvin to Veret, 204 separate letters. Veret to Calvin, 185 letters. Not only do these letters frankly discuss theological problems and church matters, they demonstrate much openness, problems of their private lives. For example, once Calvin is challenging Pharrell for being too long-winded in his preaching. (laughs) That takes an honest friend. Biblical friendships are constant, they are candid. Third, they are careful. That's where we left off last time. They are careful. First of all, we said careful about, do you remember who was listening? Make sure you weren't just here in body about how you speak. That's right, how you speak. We looked at various verses, minor threats, major threats to friendship, but also careful about who you're with. Not just how you speak, but who you're with. You see, good friendships are like a garden. It must be watered. It has to be nurtured. It has to be tended. It has to be weeded. I know there's some renowned gardeners in the Antioch family here who have spectacular gardens that are hard-earned and they didn't just fall from the sky. So it is with good friendships. A couple questions that have arisen when I have taught on this and I've enjoyed the interaction and feedback from some of you. Just two quick questions in relation to this third point, careful about how you speak and who you're with. 
Someone has asked, what about friendly greetings between the opposite sex? A few remarks. Yes, there is the holy kiss in the New Testament. In the ancient culture of their day, greet one another with a holy kiss. We read a few times in the New Testament. But the implication would be there is an unholy kiss. In other words, there are certain greetings, especially between the opposite sex, that are not appropriate. It would be unsanctified and unrighteous and ungodly, except with your spouse. What does that mean today? Well, it's going to vary a little in each culture, but I think it's safe to say any greeting that might stir up romantic affections or physical desire is never appropriate outside of marriage. I know we've talked about this before. I don't mean to harp on it, but I also uh, don't think <laughs> we've said too much about it. This trend amongst younger people today, teenagers, church youth groups, Christian young adult friendships, of perpetual hugging, <laughs> it doesn't lend itself to sexual purity. Every time you see each other, you say goodbye, you have to have these long, prolonged hugs in the name of friendship. I'm not sure that's wise, and I think it can become unholy. Yes, we should be eager to give warm, friendly Christian greetings, but remember, they ought to be holy, Scripture says, set apart, distinct from the world. We ought to be careful to keep our friendships pure, avoid anything that would cause another to stumble or be tempted. All right, another interesting question here that has arisen. What about keeping up with long-distance friends from the past? How hard should you work on friends from another stage or age or season or place of your life, especially in this uh, Facebook age where I know uh, I have something like 3,000 friends and I just don't know what I'd do without them. They are so dear to me. Um, uh, I don't know how I get through a day of my life without those Facebook friends. Uh, I just I get teared up thinking about the, the depth of those bonds. <laughs> It's a personal website, it's a ministry platform, it's a place to spread information, it's cheapened and uh, almost turned uh, the, the word friend into something meaningless. But whatever the various social media, we have been reconnected with old friends in this cyber age, right? And the world supposedly has become smaller and now you're tempted by this myth of being omnipresent, that you can actually be in more than one place at, the time, at a time. Look at verse 10, we just read it. Proverbs 27, verse 10. Don't forsake your own friend or your father's friend. Don't go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better a neighbor who is near than a brother far away. Friendship is local. Friendship is very physical, bodily, tangible. I first did this study pre-COVID. Our brother Joe mentioned on all the harm that lockdowns did to churches and yet a purifying and a strengthening of churches as well, though painful. When the Lord says it's better, it really is better. We shouldn't try to improve on God's plan. Better a neighbor, look at the end of verse 10, Proverbs 27, verse 10, a neighbor near than a brother far away. It seems the list of oxymorons today, you might not agree with me, you might say maybe, but I think most of these words I'm going to fire off to you are blatant or, or at least almost blatant oxymorons. Digital friendship. <laughs> virtual companionship. I always like to tell people, well, how about a virtual honeymoon? Let me know how that goes after you're married. Zoom church. <laughs> Online community. Live stream worship service. Ten years ago, even, if someone told us that, we might have laughed. We should have laughed. And now it's become accepted vocab in a confused world. We're called to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We saw last time in Proverbs. Who loves at all times is born for adversity. That requires you being there in person in the flesh. Only God is omnipresent. Despite all these high-tech tools of our day, we can still only occupy one place at one time. A pastor friend of mine used to say years ago, when smartphones came out, he would say, when you have me, you have me. And that stuck with me. He's like, I'm not going to be distracted by my phone. I must commend South Africans again. I've noticed when Americans visit sometimes, or if I'm uh, over visiting in the States, the etiquette for notifications 
and most other technologies is just generally ruder and more impersonal in America. South Africans still seem to be more careful about turning off your notifications, sitting at a family meal. I'm sure it's getting worse. The West and the American influence is, is, is deadly in those areas. But I, I find in, in certain other cultures, like in the States, there's just no, no etiquette. And I remember when I first got my smartphone, Michelle just captured it well. She's like, great, your laptop in your pocket. And I remember going, whoa, handle with care. That's what is going on here. And you're talking to people and their notifications are going off and you just, sometimes if they're good enough friends, I suppose once or, yeah, no, I don't think I've ever had that much courage. But you, you, you want to say to them, you're not that important. I promise. <laughs> you're just not. And neither am I. And now it's not the phone, right? It's the watch. And you're, like, you're just trying to talk to someone who's like, Used to, that was rude, right? You all, remember it used to, you'd find a clever way to like, I can see while I'm preaching, you know, like people be like, you know, like look at their watch. Nowadays it's normal, it's normal, smart watches. And I'm just going, who cares? I mean, unless you are like a doctor or you're on emergency call, I'm guessing odds are nine out of 10. You're not that important. Switch it off and let's give each other our full attention. Nobody wants a distracted friend. Treat others the way you would want to be treated. Wherever you are, be all there. Ecclesiastes says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, undivided. I think there's a warning here when you talk about long distance friends as well, about nostalgia, sentimentalism, emotionalism, living in the past. It's easy to do, especially if you're not real happy with your present. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 10, do not say, why is it that the former days were better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. There it is, straight from the Bible, a warning about drowning in nostalgia, being paralyzed by deja vu and the good old days. It feeds discontentment over your presence and the friends that God has given you. Look again at that phrase, Proverbs 27.10, better a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. Perhaps you could say it this way, snack on long distance friends, feast on local friends. I'm, that's not endorsing cannibalism. <laughs> it's <laughs> nearby friends are your bread and butter, the real marrow of life. You only have so many hours in the day, right? How do you redeem the time? How do you number your days wisely and profitably? Your staple diet should be building biblical friendships here and now, starting with your own local church. If you still have some extra space on your plate for a little side dish of old friends somewhere else, fine, enjoy it. But don't get those two backwards. We all know people, don't we, who snack on local friends, but they feast on this fantasy world of long-distance relationships in remote places, online, etc. And it feeds spiritual pride. It makes you into a maverick. It nourishes an independent spirit. It creates this rugged autonomy and this lone range that puts you in a dangerous place because there aren't real friends that can speak into your life and the joy of you speaking into their life. John Quincy Adams, sixth president of the United States, wrote it this way, poetically. He says, I want a warm and faithful friend to cheer the adverse hour who ne'er to flatter will descend nor bend the knee to power. I want a friend to chide me when I'm wrong, my inmost soul to see and that my friendship prove as strong to him as his to me. That's a biblical sentiment and attitude. Number four, we've seen biblical friends are constant, candid, careful, and number four, where we end tonight is they counsel you wisely. They counsel you wisely. If they are candid, as we saw at number two, then that is one aspect of, of counseling one another. We need friends that are not only candid, but they also guide and comfort and direct us wisely as each situation demands and as we walk through life together. Let's jump to a few Proverbs. Look at 24, 6. Look back at Proverbs 24, verse 5 and 6, actually, to get a little of the context here. 24, 5. A wise man is strong and a man of knowledge increases power. What makes him so potent? And so influential, verse 6, for by wise guidance you will wage war, and in an abundance of counselors there is victory. He's done his homework. He has got the necessary information and input. Wise, he seeks wise counsel. Look at 2018, Proverbs 20, verse 18. 
prepare plans by consultation and make wise war, make war by wise guidance. 1522, 1522. Notice this recurring theme, this clear pattern of being deliberate and intentional and purposeful about seeking wise counsel. This isn't just running around until you get the opinion that you want. Proverbs 15, verse 22. Without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. And then look at 1114, one other text. 11, Proverbs 11, verse 14. Where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in an abundance of counselors, there is victory. Who wants defeat? Nobody wants to be a loser in life. Men, you admit it, even in a world of GPSs, there's times where we get lost on a road trip and we are notorious about not asking for directions. <laughs> and our wives are sitting there saying, can we just humble ourselves and get some help so we actually arrive at our destination? Is that asking too much? You were not made to be self-sufficient. We weren't made to be omnicompetent. We don't have all the answers. We need each other. We need wise counsel. We need good advice. We need careful research. We need uh, expert consultation or we will fail. Please can I clarify something? And we spoke about this recently at a pastor's and, and staff meeting and occasionally as elders as well. Be careful of being over-counseled. In a church this size, it's probably wise... I would say in most cases, if you are seeing more than one person for repeated counsel, ask your pastors or elders or your small group leader, who's the point person? Who is the primary counselor in my life so that I'm not hogging and stealing too much time from leaders in a, a, a large flock where there's a lot of other people that need counsel? So if you're getting counsel from three different people, uh, who's the point person? Because let's make sure they're agreeing and make sure you don't get a reputation of just jumping around till you get the counsel that you want. But even if it's sincere and the con counselors all agree, there might be 10 other people who aren't even asking and who need counsel. But be careful to be clear on who's the point person who is counseling you and how we seek wise counsel. Your leaders care for you. They want what's best for you and they can do that when they are aware of, uh, of the counsel that's being given and not neglecting others who also need counsel and maybe aren't, aren't asking. There's a lot of wisdom here about not rushing ahead on major decisions before seeking right counsel. Praise God for our building committee in phase one and as we've begun meeting and praying and talking about possibilities for phase two and purchase of land and expansion. All the more thankful I am for the work that Andre and the men did. Franco was just saying recently, you and I who aren't builders don't realize for a building eight years old to have had so few problems, you know, we could get a little charismatic, right, and say, you know, there's, uh, uh, the Lord has been faithful and uh, we believe in providence. Uh, he hasn't promised us that we won't have to do repairs and upkeep, but to put Franco and the boys on the spot, I think part of it is because they also did a really thorough job and they did their research <laughs> and they built it properly <laughs> and carefully. And so uh, we've had an, an unusual uh, ha hassle-free uh, upkeep so far and we enjoy a beautiful building. At the wedding yesterday, people said, this is brand new, did you just move in? I said, yeah, eight years ago. Serious? Yeah, eight years ago. Because of a team of friends <laughs> who, uh, <laughs> you know, Friendship has various, you know, Greek, Italian, you know, South African uh, expressions to it, right? And uh, uh, godly camaraderie and healthy arm wrestling and give and take, we'll see in a moment, you know, iron sharpening iron with good research and wise counsel that leads to the best outcomes. We might have finished the building quicker, but it wouldn't have lasted, right? 27.9, look over at 27.9. Proverbs 27, verse 9. We read it a moment ago. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, so a man's counsel is sweet to his friend. Do you understand, beloved? Bad counsel makes you ugly. <laughs> if you want to have B.O., body odor, and be a smelly Christian, get foolish advice. Good counsel beautifies and adorns you like oil, like perfume. 
new believers, we all make this mistake at times where you rush into a major decision, right? I mean, you're, you're buying a house, you're taking a job, you're, you're, you're getting married, you only do that once normally. And it, you ought to seek earnest counsel. But it's concerning when you see believers who have been saved for a while and there's a pattern that they keep doing it. And it's the fifth time and you're like, you did what? You, did, you, you went where? You made what decision? And you still didn't ask anyone? And now we're supposed to help you pick up the pieces for the twelfth time? Really? Pause. Breathe. Ask. Consult. We want to save you a lot of pain. Not always just be picking up the pieces. You could have prevented this, my friend. Ungodly counsel. Foolish friends stink up your life. But godly counsel, wise friends, fills your soul. The idea here in, in Proverbs 27, verse 9, is with a sweet fragrance. We think of the aroma of Christ, do we not? What's more pleasurable, more satisfying than wise counsel, faithful friends? They know you. They know the situation. They advise you skillfully. Kevin DeYoung says the best friends combine their IQs and get smarter as a result. <laughs> do you have a friend like that? That you can turn to with your toughest predicaments, with your darkest secrets, Friends you actually can trust. Friends ready to counsel you on sexual matters, money matters, emotional hurt, pain from your past. Someone said a friend is someone who knows the song in your heart and can sing it back to you when you have forgotten the words. Mm. That's what wise counsel does from a godly friend. Look down at verse 17. This is our theme verse for iron men. We still want to excel much more in this area. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. A vivid image, a great word picture, a file sharpening an axe, a steel that sharpens a hunting or a carving knife. Joel Beakey says this to married people. When your spouse gives you wise counsel, he or she is sharpening the blade of your soul to a razor's edge so you'll be a more powerful weapon for the Lord. Building Biblical friendships, it hones your skills in, in godly, wise living and making good decisions. Get this image that Kevin DeYoung helps us with. Christian, ask yourself, am I a sponge that never hurts anyone but never helps much either? Am I a sword that cuts to the quick but also destroys? Or am I a stone, not a sponge, not a sword, but a stone, the kind of friend upon which others can be sharpened made better and more mature. Faithful friends make better stones than they do sponges or swords. What a contrast to the world's selfish view of friendship. Listen to this quote from a popular secular psychological author on friendship. Quote, the common thread in friendships is our overriding need for self-esteem. Most of us have some lingering doubts about our attitudes and lifestyle. Having people close who think and feel as we do can be very comforting. The law of selective exposure suggests that we av avoid information that challenges our beliefs. Friendship is probably the purest form of selecting our own propaganda. Relationships with similar others make us feel good about who we are. I hope that's shocking to you in light of Scripture, but it's actually very accurate of the world we live in, isn't it? This therapeutic, narcissistic, self-centered view of friendship. When Proverbs says we need iron that sharpens iron, there's some personality clashes that are helpful. There's times where friendship should hurt. The sparks need to fly. The rough edges need to be shaved off. We build one another up. We chisel one another's character. It concerns me when I hear people saying, you know what, I don't like being around so-and-so. They're just intimidating for me. They have more children than, than me and my wife are comfortable with. Or he works harder than I'm comfortable with. Or they uh, do more of this. Or they do less of this. Or they read more of this. Or they earn this. Or they give this. Or they pray this. Or they worship this. And I just feel awkward. I feel they're like holier than me. And I just can't keep up with them. And I smile and go, I praise God for friends like that. If all my friends are unintimidating and easy and they don't spur me on, I'm in a dangerous place. I want to be around <laughs> those who are ahead of me and spur me on. Hebrews 10, verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Hebrews 10, 24. 
Jonathan Lehman writes, Friendship is one of the primary means of grace the Lord uses to keep church members growing in grace and bound to one another like the sinews between muscles. Friendship helps church members to fight sin, disciple younger Christians, spur one another on to love and good deeds. Rare indeed are these kind of biblical friendships where we're not just stroking and flattering and pleasing one another, but actually helping each other to grow in personal holiness and, and usefulness to Christ. Iron sharpens iron, 2717. So one man sharpens another. You don't just need nice friends who let you be yourself. You need wise friends who encourage you to be a better self. A more Christ-like, fruitful, godly, holy, useful self for the kingdom. I love that summary picture of David and Jonathan, their whole friendship. 1 Samuel 23, verse 18. Jonathan once more risks his life to go out to David deep in the remote desert, the wilderness of Ziph, and it says he did this to strengthen David's hand in God. How weak, how defeated we will be otherwise without such friends. Do you have that kind of friend who counsels you wisely? Are you willing to be that kind of friend to others? Daniel Doriani, excellent book we did years ago in Iron Man, The Life of a God-Made Man. Doriani writes, certain spiritual lessons are best taught by friends. Friends warn of hidden weaknesses and encourage hidden strengths. Their confidence impels us to take risks for the kingdom, to uncover buried talents. Friendship provides another source of companionship, taking pressure off marriages. Through their wise counsel and godly example, friends help us walk with God. He says, friendship brings comfort in affliction, partnership in adversity, joy in companionship. Friends build good lives together. And if you believe all this, you must pursue it. Not wait for it to happen. Now some of you may be thinking, there's a big question when we talk about this fourth mark, biblical friendships counsel wisely, there's a shadow over this whole subject. Today, when you want to get counsel, the question comes up of who should even be doing the counseling. In the last century, the world has undergone this radical friendship revolution and this redefining of counseling that's been called the triumph of the therapeutic. And friendship and fellowship and, and counsel in the church has been taken captive by psychology. This, this new false gospel of therapy. And what used to be the work of the church and good friends has now been hijacked and stolen away by all these Freudian and atheistic and psychotherapeutic categories. Until about 100 years ago, professional counseling as such did not exist. Nowadays, most Christians have been so brainwashed, they think that the deep emotional problems of the soul cannot be helped by the church or by godly friends. You've got to go to some expensive stranger, otherwise known as a professional. Usually their counsel consists of worldly ideologies, unbiblical theories, maybe Christianized with some Bible verses tacked on or Jesus pixie dust sprinkled in. Counseling has been kidnapped by the world. Counseling has been taken out of the church. It's been stripped away from friendships. It's been outsourced and exiled to the specialists. Pastoral ministry is redefined. And friendship is now reduced to uh, relationships that help you with the minor stuff, but nothing too serious. If you've got a real problem, sorry. Uh, uh, don't bother me, friend. You know, go see someone with a lot of degrees and letters after their name. From the start of the Bible, Genesis 1, to the start of the Psalter, Psalm 1, God is forever warning us to avoid bad counsel, no matter how pretty it's dressed up, how religious it sounds. And in contrast to today's psychologized Christianity, listen to some of the New Testament portraits of fellowship, the, 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 some of the texts, the one another passages that are what, surely what a wise friendship is all about and caring for one another's souls. In addition to Proverbs and all else that we've seen in Ecclesiastes and and David and Jonathan and so forth. Remember Romans 15 verse 14. For I am confident that you are competent to, that you are filled with all knowledge, that you are competent to counsel one another. Romans 15 14. Colossians 1. We proclaim him. Verse 28. Admonishing and teaching one another. 
Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you admonish, counsel, help, encourage one another. Quickly, look over at 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18. I know the word trauma gets thrown out and used for everything today from the most hectic and severe and horrific, catastrophic, real trauma to the fact that you didn't get the flavor of ice cream that you wanted today at lunchtime. Everything is now called traumatic. Well, I think it's fair to say losing a loved one, the death of a family member, is traumatic. And look at how the church is supposed to handle that. First Thessalonians chapter 4. It's talking about those who are asleep. In other words, the Christians who've died, verse 13. And what do we do about that? He talks about the hope we have. The dead in Christ will rise first and the Lord will descend and we'll all be with the Lord forever. And then verse, first Thessalonians 4, verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Jump down to chapter 5, verse 11. In the middle of some pretty in-depth, thick, in times uh, eschatological teaching. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as also you are doing. Verse 14. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Yes, formally, counseling and the care of souls is the work of pastors and elders and leaders in the church going after the needs but informally, counseling is the work of every member. Sure, some are more gifted, some are more involved, some are more available as needs arise. But we need to reclaim counseling in the church and in our friendships. That's why we do the ACT course. Sign up, prepare now for ACT 2025, right? We have all the resources we need for such counsel, don't we? Second Peter chapter 1, everything you need for life and godliness. Four proverbial keys to building biblical friendships. Biblical friendships are, what's the first one? Constant, the second one. Candid, the third one. Careful. And the fourth one, they are, they counsel wisely. If you're sitting there saying, Tim, I just want to confess the dominant thought in my mind right now is I am disappointed that I don't have enough or any friends like this. And my answer to you would be, guess who usually does have friends like this? The person who is that kind of friend to others. The person with the best friendships is the one who works harder at being a friend than finding friends. Jesus taught us, right? Acts 20, 35, it's more blessed to give than receive. He modeled this for supremely for us, right? As the perfect friend. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. As pastors, as members, our burden should be for strangers and visitors. Nothing can be more lonely than that Isolation of not knowing anyone and no one in the church greets you. Shame on us if we fail to do that. But when such a person continues to isolate themselves and waits to be greeted and never makes an effort, at some point no amount of greeting will be enough. And sometimes those people are on their 10th church because they continue bouncing around, sucking, leeching, mooching, and waiting to be loved. It's a lonely life. But it's a happy and it's a joyful life, seeking to love, going after others. And in doing so, the more you seek to be a friend, you find friends. I've seen this in huge churches I've been a part of, mega churches with thousands, and small churches with barely 100 people. The ones who focus most on being a good friend rarely lack friends. They're too busy pouring out their lives for others, opening up their home, reaching out to the needy. They don't lack friends. They're so busy befriending others that they discover satisfying relationships along the way. You're far less likely to feel that your church is not caring and too cliquish, etc., when you're 
busy building biblical friendships, being the best friend you can be for others. What did Jesus say? Easy to find the speck? Whoa, 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 whoa. Start with the log, the plank in your own eye. Remember at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God is poured out, revival comes, the church is born, and one of the first evidences that God was at work, Acts 2.42, they didn't wait, no one else had to do it for them, they weren't passive, they actively devoted themselves to fellowship, they took friendship very seriously, they deliberately, intentionally, purposefully pursued it, they were committed to community, they were this newborn family, they were set free from sin, they were gathered at the feet of Christ under his word and sound doctrine together. And so I ask you, friend, <laughs> what's your friendship plan for the rest of 2023? How about picking one or two other people in this church body you're going to pursue more intentionally, more deliberately for regular spiritual conversation, starting with simple questions. Hey, friend, what are you thankful for lately? How can I pray for you? Can I share with you something I learned in the sermon today? Can I mention to you something I read in God's Word or a Christian book that I'm reading? I told all the guys, you find the best godly babes at the book table. Where else? Why not read through a great Christian book together? I thought I'd mention a few quickly that I found um, helpful. Vaughn Roberts, True Friendship, Walking Shoulder to shoulder. Another Christian author, Edward, Ed Welch, side by side, walking with others in wisdom and love. Another one I really like, Jonathan Holmes, The Company We Keep in Search of Biblical Friendship. And one last one, Paul Tautges, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, I think it might be German, Paul Tautges, Counseling One Another, a Theology of Interpersonal Discipleship. Why not read through that? together. Please understand, church family, this is not about adding one more thing to your already hectic life. <laughs> it is about making friendship a priority, but it's more about a growing culture amongst us, right? It's a mindset. It's an attitude. It's how you view church every time you walk in. It's, it's simple as where am I going to sit today when I walk into the sanctuary. I love seeing a number of our church body. It's not wrong to have routines and familiar places, but I love to see how people are also strategic. And they're like, oh, oh, yeah, I've been wanting to follow up with that person, or I know they've been lonely, or there's a need over there. And Many are busy, and some people have to shoot off after church. At least they're here on a Sunday night, but you may only have five minutes. You snooze, you lose. <laughs> Even where you sit can make all the difference in how the Lord could use you in another person's life. Making the most of ordinary opportunities, arriving a bit earlier, staying a bit later, helping someone to their car, using the tea time, even taking someone along with you to a small group, to a course, rather than just this consumer mindset of, well, do I need the marriage class or do I need the Christian Explain class or am I gonna go to Chris Anderson? Rather saying, who will I take with me? What, what, how can others benefit from this as well? Think of each gathering, each church event, each item this week on the, the ministry calendar as a friendship appointment that you want to make sure and keep and use for the Lord. It's easy just to, for us on Fridays, to be at Iron Men but never be iron. <laughs> You can be at a, 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 a so-called uh, fellowship meeting but not actually have fellowship. In where I grew up in the, in the Baptist churches in the States, the minor hall was called the Fellowship Hall. But sadly, I knew many people who weren't even saved and all they ever did was socialize and talk about the football game or the basketball game or the, you know, the weather or the politics and, and never talk about Jesus. So you spend all your time in the Fellowship Hall without any fellowship. You can be with the church and not be the church, attending meetings without building relationships. It starts with greetings. It doesn't get more simple than that, right? Amazing, as I think back on this pre-COVID, pre-lockdowns. <laughs> I was shocked that godly Christians were like, that's it, never gonna shake hands again, never gonna see each other's faces. I mean, they just, just rolled over. They're like, that's it. 
We're going to forever be, you know, like just kind of like typing hello, uh, a digital greeting. Praise God that we have resisted that. And we can obey what is the New Testament is full of. Greeting, caring for one another. How about making it your mission on a Sunday? Before you go and speak to those you know, we tried to do this when our kids were younger. First, a new face or a name you don't know. Or before you sit down, you're going to greet one person. Before you go to your car, just one person that you don't know, to greet them in the name of Christ. Imagine what that would do to a church culture. Praise God, I know for many who already do that and show much kindness and care and, and friendliness. Let me close with this. I think there's some of you here tonight that need to admit I don't have great friends because I'm not a great friend. I don't have great friends because I'm not a great friend. I need a savior. I need the greatest of all friends before I can ever be a true friend. Jesus alone was the perfect friend. Always constant. <laughs> forever faithful, always candid, perfectly careful, only wise in his counsel. John 15, remember what Jesus said there in the upper room? I'll read it for you. This is my commandment, John 15, 12, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. The greatest friend is the one who sacrifices the most. And there's no question who that is. The Lord Jesus Christ. He delivers you from your greatest trouble. He meets your deepest need. He rescues you from sin. He saves you from the very wrath of God and hell itself. Only because of his cross, only by his power and his spirit within us can we ever be the friends we ought to be. We befriend because we have been befriended. We love horizontally because we have been loved vertically. Christ's friendship to us through the cross liberates us to be the friends we need to be to others. I love the way someone put it. Make Christ the friend your heart desires and you will have all the friends you could ever need. Make Christ the friend your heart desires and you will have all the friends you could ever need. Beaky closes with this parable of friendship. There's a man with three friends and he's charged with a serious crime and he's summoned to court. He went to his first friend for help, but all the friend could offer was a nice set of clothes to wear to his appearance before the judge. The man goes next to his second friend, but that friend could only accompany him to the entrance of the courtroom. The third friend not only went with the man all the way into the court, but he pled his case so well the man was acquitted and set free. And friend, this is you on your deathbed when you breathe your last. You will have three friends. First, your material wealth. At best, it'll give you a nice suit for your coffin and burial. Second, you have dear ones on earth. They love you. They cannot accompany you beyond death's door. And third, you have the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a believer, he is with you through life and death. He alone can plead your case in heaven that you, so that you are counted righteous before holy God. There is no greater friend you could ever have than the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. I love these words of John Newton, one of his lesser known hymns that sums up so well everything that we have read and learned and seen in this three-part series. One there is above all others, well deserves the name of friend. His is love beyond a brother's, costly, free. It knows no end. They who once his kindness prove find it everlasting love. Which of all our friends to save us could or would have shed their blood? But our Jesus died to have us, reconciled in him to God. This was boundless love indeed. Jesus is a friend in need. Could we bear from one another what he daily bears from us? Yet this glorious friend and brother loves us, though we treat him thus. Though for good we render ill, he accounts us brethren still. Oh, for grace our hearts to soften. Teach us, Lord, at length to love. We, alas, forget too often what a friend we have above. But when home our souls are brought, we will love thee as we ought. Father, we are thankful for the clear teaching, the wise counsel, the biblical pattern for our friendships. Forgive us for our 
selfishness by nature, by birth, by instinct, even we who are saved, the remaining sin, the indwelling corruption, the lingering temptation is there at the start of every day, throughout the day, at the end of every day, to care more about how I've been treated than how I have treated others, to be served rather than to serve. Thank you for the Lord Jesus, did what we could not do, purchased our ransom, gave his life for us, the greatest of all friends, so that as forgiven, loved, adopted, children of yours, we can go forth in his power. We can follow in his footsteps. We can come not to be served, but to serve. We can know the greater satisfaction, the deeper joy, the fuller, uh, the, the, the greater fulfillment of giving rather than receiving. Make us these kinds of friends in a lonely and a friendless and a often hostile world. May they know that we are Christians. May they see that we are Jesus' disciples by a distinct, a supernatural, a unique, new covenant, spirit-filled, cross-shaped love for one another, a friendship and a loyalty towards one another that makes the unbelievers want to come out of the cold, cruel world and to warm themselves at this gospel fire and to know the transforming power of Christ and his word in our relationships, starting with our, in our homes, in our marriages, in our families, and in the household of God. Grow us. May we excel still more. As Paul prayed for the Colossians, knit our hearts together in love. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our midst and the joy of being family, brothers and sisters, the redeemed, bought by, at the highest price, the blood of your Son. In his worthy and loving name we pray. Amen.